One of the finest films to ever grace the silver screen is the film The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, a film adapted from the 1961 novel written by acclaimed author Muriel Spark. In this film, we follow the story of several young women who are mentored by the acclaimed, refined, and cultured teacher of Marcia Blaine All Girls School in Edinburgh, Miss Jean Brody, played by the legendary Triple Crown actress. Dame Maggie Smith. The girls are referred to as the Brody set because of the qualities they represent to Miss Brody. Breaking down the characters, we have Sandy. Sandy represents Jean's inquisitive nature and ability to assess the situation and think critically about the right outcome. Sandy is also the de facto leader of the Brody set and the most cherished and trusted confidant to Miss Brody. Jenny is a beautiful and passionate girl. She represents Jean Brody's youth. She is Miss Brody's favorite pupil and dreams of Jenny being a muse and lover of her former colleague and current lover, the art teacher, Teddy Lloyd. I just want to mention this man has multiple children and... He is teetering, if not a PDF file. So uh, uh, that's all I'm going to say about Mr. Lloyd. That's it. <laughs> then we have Monica, who is a sort of cipher in some ways. She's not as pretty as Jenny, but pretty enough. It seems that Monica is based on the character Rose Stanley from the novel, the only character to shake off the influence of Miss Brody upon graduation and actually marries above her status. Mary McGregor is the one everyone looks down on, even the teachers at Marcia Blaine. She's someone who suffers from low self-esteem and has speech impediment in the film. She's often portrayed as the scapegoat and treated cruelly by Miss Brody and Sandy. She's not as conventionally pretty as the rest of her mates and is highly susceptible to influence. Unfortunately, she is also the tragic character who dies fighting for the wrong side during the Spanish Civil War. Over the years from primary school to graduation into adulthood, the Brody set grows apart. Miss Brody is a fascist who has preached her love of Franco and Mussolini and her love that youth should enjoy the power of their youth to its fullness and fall in love as soon as possible. Miss Brody believes there is nothing quite like being a lover to someone else. Jean Brody has been imparting pieces of herself to fresh, impressionable minds for years. The subjects that she teaches are highly alternative and downright fringe the curriculum and standards of Marcia Blaine. There is a cost to this style. Of teaching, the style of narcissism and toxic influence that has put her on the hit list with Miss Mackay for years, who has been trying to find grounds for her dismissal. Miss Mackay is the headmistress, if you will, of the school. Jean Brody has also been sleeping with both Teddy Lloyd and the school's boisterous music teacher, Gordon Lowther. Gordon loves Miss Brody and wants to marry her and take her back to his ancestral home where they would be happy together and have a family. Miss Brody does not want that type of life and she loves her independence. When Mary McGregor runs off to join her brother to fight, she hops on the train, a train going to the wrong side of the war, and is killed. Mary only went because she wanted to make Miss Brody proud. Over in the course of the film, Miss Brody talks about how great it is to sacrifice herself for a cause, you know, how to fight for, you know, the fascists of their time. And like all impressionable people, there's always one who just soaks up every single word. And unfortunately, Mary was the one who was ten toes down with Miss Jean Brody, even if Miss Jean Brody didn't even acknowledge her existence. She wasn't, she was just a hanger on to the rest of the group. And unfortunately, the realest one, quote unquote, died for her. Over the course of tale towards the end of the film, Miss Brody gets called into Miss Mackay's office where she is told she's being let go. That these complaints have been made to the board of school affairs and that she has no she has no say in in the process, only that she has to follow what they dictate, and unfortunately she's on the chopping block. That Ms. Mackay reveals that someone revealed incriminating information that was the final nail in bringing her termination charges against Ms. Brody. Jean Brody's reckless influence over impressionable young minds has inevitably gone too far. As Ms. Brody hears the news, she solemnly wanders back to her classroom to collect her things. She wonders who could have told about these horrible lies about her. Suddenly, Ms. Brody hears a celebration that Mr. Lowther her former lover is marrying the young and pretty science teacher of Marcia Blaine, Miss Lockhart, and they actually get engaged. This breaks her heart down to the core and just is another nail in her heart. And she's realizing that, yeah, my prime, my so unquote, quote unquote prime, I think it's pretty much a wrap for me now. I want to show you the scene entitled Assassin and give my brief thoughts on it 
and the legendary Maggie Smith. Sandy. Sandy. I believe, Sandy. I believe I am past my prime. <laughs> I had reckoned on my prime lasting till I was at least 50. Are you listening, Sandy? I'm listening, Miss Brody. I have been dismissed from Marcia Blaine. I am accused of teaching treason and sedition to my students. I am being transported for radicalism, like Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill. But if Miss Mackay and her conspirators expect that I shall meekly lay my head on their chopping block, they are in for a wee surprise. What will you do? As I am formed, Miss Mackay, I will resort to public petition. I have no doubt that many supporters will rally to my defence. My students are loyal. My girls. Someone betrayed me, Sandy. Someone spoke against me to the board. Who could it have been? Who? Are you thinking that maybe one of your girls betrayed you? I said to Miss Mackay, I have the loyalty of my girls. And she said, do you? I'll not believe it. I'll not believe it was one of my girls. Perhaps it's true. I thought possibly Monica. Oh, there's very little soul Monica behind Monica is a liar. I know. You all are Monica and Jenny. Oh, not Jenny. She's like a part of myself. You, Sandy, as you see, you are exempt from all suspicion. You have had more of my confidence than anyone. You know more than anyone what I have sacrificed for my girls. Teddy Lloyd was greatly in love with me, Sandy, as I think you have always known. And I gave him up to consecrate my life to the young girls in my care. You and Monica and Jenny. Jenny. She and Mr. Lloyd will soon be lovers. I have that. Do you think that you are providence? That you can ordain love? What? You haven't pulled it off. Jenny will not be Teddy Lloyd's lover. What are you saying, Sandy? Jenny will not be Teddy Lloyd's lover, and I'll not be your spy. Your secret service. My spy? What on earth are you talking about? Do you understand at all what has happened to me? I have been dismissed from Marcia Blaine. Why are you standing there talking about with Providence and the secret service? What is the matter with you? Miss Brodie, I am Teddy's lover. What? I am Teddy's lover. Teddy's lover? You! Is that so difficult to believe? What does it matter to you which one of us it is? It doesn't matter to Teddy. Whatever possessed you, you know his religion. How could a girl with a mind of her own have to do with a man who can't think for himself? That doesn't seem to have bothered either of us, does it? We were neither of us very interested in his mind. How dare you speak to me in this manner? I suppose I've always known that one day you were going to ask, how dare I? Why, I don't understand. I don't seem to understand what has happened to everyone. Where has everyone gone? Only Mary is gone. Mary? What has Mary to do with it? Miss Brodie, Mary McGregor is dead. Are you aware of...
of the order of importance in which you place your anxieties. One, you have been betrayed. Two, who is or is not to be your proxy in Teddy Lloyd's bed? And three, Mary's death. Miss Brodie, aren't you concerned at all with Mary's death? I grieve for Mary. It was because of you she went. Because of me, it was her brother. The poor unfortunate girl hadn't anyone else in the world. She had you. That was her misfortune. To please you, that silly, stupid girl ran off and got herself killed. Don't you feel responsible for that? No. No, I feel responsible for giving her ideals. The ideals that sent her to Spain. I feel responsible for teaching her that service to a cause is a privilege. You call it a privilege to be killed. And for nothing. Nothing. You really are a shallow girl, Sandy. By the way, she died. Mary McGregor illumined her life. She died a heroine. She died a fool. Joining her brother to fight for Franco, wasn't that just like Mary? Her brother is fighting for the other side. Her brother? Her brother is fighting for the Republicans. Mary was headed for the wrong army. Oh, Mary McGregor. Mary McGregor. I used to wonder why I always called Mary by her full name. I think it was because you had such a hard time remembering who she was. Poor dim Mary. I was devoted to Mary. No, you were only attracted to Mary because she had no one else and she was so totally suggestible. She appealed to your vanity. It was you who betrayed me. I didn't betray you. I simply put a stop to you. Oh. I see. No, you don't see. You don't see that you're not good for people. In what way? In what way, Sandy, was I not good for you? You are dangerous and unwholesome, and children should not be exposed to you. How can you think? Think it. How can you think that I would harm you? But you have. You have harmed me. How? You have murdered Mary. You have assassinated me. Oh, why must you always strike attitudes? You really are a ridiculous woman. What will you do? No. Do? I don't know. But I am a descendant. Do not forget of Willie Brody. He was a man of substance, a cabinet maker and a designer of gibbets. A member of the town council of Edinburgh, the keeper of two mistresses who bore him five children between them. Blood tells. He played much dice in fighting cocks. Eventually, he was a wanted man for having robbed the excise office. Not that he needed the money. He was a burglar for the sake of the danger. He died cheerfully on a gibbet of his own devising in 1788. That is the stuff I am made of. I knew you would rise like a phoenix. I'm glad I shall not have to worry about you. No, I expect that is to be your gift, Sandy, to kill without concern. It is you who are dangerous. You see yourself as a conqueror, don't you, Sandy? Kaiserian in all his beauty rare. But you profess to be a great admirer of conquerors. Goodbye, Miss Brodie. Sandy, played by the remarkable Pamela Franklin, waiting for Miss Brodie, is probably the most creepy and awesome thing I've seen on film. 
Miss Brody can feel someone in the room, just like she could feel her power and prime slipping away with each year that passes by. I often on this channel talk about the space actors inhabit, and I guess what I mean is how the scene is set with an industry term they call blocking. What is blocking? Blocking is the process by which filmmakers determine how they will photograph a scene in a film or TV show and how they will construct its elements in anticipation of editing. It is a combination of positioning actors and or objects and positioning a camera or multiple cameras. Sandy takes her time with killing Miss Brody. Not literally killing Miss Brody, but just the idea of her. She drags out the kill by asking Miss Brody, what's wrong? You know what's wrong. You're responsible for this, right? Miss Brody is feeling herself so much. She's so much wrapped up in her own narcissism that she does not even know that the person responsible for her doom is standing right behind her. Miss Brody tries to fumble through her pride and zero in on who is actually her Judas, who amongst the Brody set or maybe the new generation is behind this betrayal. She reflects on the words Miss Mackay said. I said to Miss Mackay, I have the loyalty of my girls. And she said, do you? Miss Brody goes down the list of the Brody set. No, it couldn't have been Monica. Even Sandy joins in by adding Monica's just too loyal. Miss Brody agrees with her. And she would say that like Monica, she would never do such a thing. I noticed that over the course of the scene, Sandy does get quite impatient and rushing her, her method of destroying Brody when, when Miss Brody actually talks about Jenny. Oh, sweet and beautiful Jenny. It's almost an antithesis to Sandy in some regards, even though they were quote unquote friends and classmates. This was Miss Brody's cherished pupil. She doesn't really have an affinity for Sandy. You're, you're more of like a pet, so to speak. And this is when, this is what Sandy picks up on. You thought that Jenny was going to do this and that. And Miss Brody, I'm Teddy's, Teddy Lloyd's lover. I can go on and on about this scene. I just love the shifts in power dynamics and how Miss Brody seems to be ignorant of Sandy's potential, her presence, and the fact that she could even be capable of such a deceit. Sandy looks at Miss Brody as truly pathetic individual, but an individual she once admired. Director Ronald Name directed another masterpiece, The Poseidon Adventure, but I always find my way, find my way coming back to Miss Jean Brody. Everything about this film came together beautifully. Now, um, when I wrote this script um, earlier this week, I had no idea about the, it kind of caught me off guard and she passed away um friday the 27th so by the time this video gets uploaded it'll probably it'll be yesterday that she passed away a lot of people wonder why when they you know see a video of somebody talking about someone passing they wonder why why are you sad that actor passed away and people die all the time they think about like besides the person who passed away didn't even know of your existence so why why are you why do you care why do you think about that and i understand that rationale However, when you have grown up watching a person on screen, a person your parents for the most part have grown up watching on screen, in some ways you feel attached to them. Dame Maggie Smith was always a person when I saw her personified regalness in class with a hefty dollop of sass. She was as funny and terrifying as Professor Minerva McGonagall appearing in seven of the eight Harry Potter films. This role alone allowed her to be close to her grandchildren. And she was even fighting breast cancer while filming the Half-Blood half Prince, which I think is remarkable and just shows the character and strength of the woman. Dame Maggie Smith is a triple crown actress. And she became that in 2003, having won two Oscars, four Emmys, and one Tony Award in her illustrious career. She was an actress who aged gracefully and loved acting and performing, leaving behind two sons who were also actors in their own right. That's his Chris Larkin and Toby Stevens. Dame Maggie Smith was a force of nature who had a beautiful spirit and a powerful voice and was always one of my favorite actors in any role she played. Rest in power, Dame Maggie Smith.